Um, to what extent is the Bible shaping your life? That's a good question. We want it to shape our life in uh, all parts of what we're doing. Today we're going to look at an episode in the New Testament where Paul really admonishes us about how we live our life today. Do you think it's a worthy motivation to live your life for reward? Careful. I think we're kind of wired to, to be for reward. And uh, I'm going to make a case this morning that there is something about living the Christian life with a future reward in mind that helps us live well today. Um, I had a dog, and if I told my dog, all I had to say to my dog was, do you want a treat? And that dog was ready to do nearly anything I wanted it to do uh, that he had memorized. And I think all of us, you know, we give blue ribbons out, participation ribbons, uh, you get a trophy if your team wins or tries. You can get the gold medal if you're uh, at the top of the heap for sports. And even in the business world, if you hit your number or you beat a deadline, you can get a reward. I think we're sort of wired to be rewarded. And it's in the Bible, which we're going to see this morning. Now, rewards are a little funny because... Um, when we get them in our life, they point the finger at how great we have done. In the spiritual realm, rewards are given in order to show God's faithfulness and goodness. But God still de delights to reward those who walk with Him. And this is a passage in the New Testament this morning um, really designed to help the church move in the right direction. In fact, one of the things Paul said, he said, life is like a race, and you should run to receive the prize. And then he illustrated, he said, like when, when you're boxing, you don't want to really box beating the air. You, no, you, you really are conditioning yourself to actually win the contest. And so much of what the Bible says is put in the context of living your life in such a way that you actually do succeed, and there is a reward for it. This is what we're going to look at this morning. Now remember, the context in which we are is Paul is writing to a church that was having all kinds of problems. We haven't even seen the worst of their problems yet. We're going to see them in the weeks ahead. But the number one problem that he was addressing was there was great division in the church. You ever been a part of a church with division? Oh, well, only if you went to a church before this one. No. It's a problem sometimes. And Paul said it was a problem to the Corinthian church, and part of the reason was they were elevating the role of their leaders to be too important, and that was creating a schism in the church. And this is sort of almost the end of the argument at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and beginning at verse 10. But let me just bring us back in our mind to verses 7 and 8, not quite on the screen yet. In verse 7 and 8, Paul actually said, so neither is he who plants around the church, nor he who waters anything. So he's using an illustration that the church is like a garden, and somebody's planting and someone's watering, but it's God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are all God's fellow workers, and we are God's field. You are God's field, and you are God's building. Now, he uses those illustrations to talk about a local church in the city of Corinth, and he says to them, you're like a field. You're God's field. And he's cultivating it. He's raised up leaders who will plant seed, Others who will come behind and as if water it. And God causes the church to grow. But I want you to have these two pictures in your mind. One is a garden. What does that remind you of? Well, the Bible starts with a garden. And it was a perfect place. And I think what's in Paul's mind is that the church is, in some sense, a recreation of Eden. Or at least 
by imagery a picture of the way it's supposed to be. People who are redeemed, growing in the likeness of Christ, you are God's field, His garden, His cultivated earth. You're renewed in your creation because you have come to find Christ for who He is. So you're like a field. Are you producing the fruit that God intends to in the church? He says to the Corinthian church, you're like a building. Well, what's the greatest building in the Bible? The temple. It's the temple where God dwelled and only the high priest could go in and be in the presence of God in the Holy of Holies once a year. But since Christ came, now the actual collection of people who know Christ are in God's mind a temple. You're the place where God dwells and Paul's going to make this point that the church, in a sense, is God's temple where he dwells. That's only possible because of what Jesus did on the cross. And when he died on the cross and he gave up his spirit, what happened to the temple? The big curtain that separated the holy place tore in two from top to bottom as if to say it's open. The death of Christ brings us into the presence of God. I just remind you of that because in about 20 minutes, we're going to take communion together. And it is designed to be the church's remembrance of what Jesus did to bring us into the presence of God, to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when you take that bread today, you're going to take that piece of bread and you're going to say, Jesus, you died for me. My sins are forgiven because of what you did on the cross. And when you take that cup, you're going to say, your lifeblood, which was shed for me, is the grounding for my being able to be a child of God. And I drink this cup as if to say I consume Christ as my only hope for eternal salvation and I trust in him. I tell you that because over the next 20 minutes, my prayer for you is that you'll be preparing your own heart so that you can eat that bread and drink that cup in a way that is worthy for God. So if something comes up in your mind today and you say, well, I'm far from God, why don't you use this time in the service to draw near to God, confess your sins, be right with Him, so that when we eat and drink in a little bit, you'll be ready to do that. But to our text. In verse 10, Paul goes on. It's on the screen now. He says, according to the grace of God given me like a skilled master builder, I laid the foundation. So he's going to take up now for the rest of the chapter the imagery of building a building, perhaps a temple. And he laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. If you underline in your Bible or you have your journal, this next phrase is worthy of underlying. It's the whole injunction of this text. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. Be careful the way you build upon the foundation of the apostles. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. This is the introductory illustration. There's a building. Christ is the foundation, but the Apostle Paul was a master builder. He, he built, if you will, on the reality of Christ's death and resurrection, the new entity called the church, which he uses in illustration as a building. Um, you can look at Acts chapter 18, you can see the way Paul began to build the church in Corinth. He went down to the synagogue, he preached there, he proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah, he proclaimed to the Jews in the synagogue in the city of Corinth, according to Acts chapter 18, that unless you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot be saved, and they kicked him out. They ran him out of the synagogue. So he went across the street to a man named Justice Titus and found a group of Gentiles who believed, and the church began to be born in the city of Corinth. And as the church began to grow, the analogy is Paul is, says, I'm building the church, and we're all building the church, which God is creating. So um, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Now, this is a picture that the church is a building that is taken up by Paul in another place, Ephesians chapter 2. He mentioned it in verse 19. He says, so then, you're no longer strangers or aliens, but you've been brought into the temple. You're fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, as if a house is being built, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole structure of the church, the the body of believers, is being joined together, and it grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him, you're being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, when you came in this morning, did you think that you were coming into a temple? We lack a little bit of the aesthetics of temples, but it's not the building. It's you. It's like we are gathering together as God's people and we are being built up into a holy gathering of people built up for a dwelling place of God. So you know that you've trusted in Christ as your Savior. So who lives inside of you? The Holy Spirit of God took a permanent residence in you. When we gather together and you come into worship on Sunday morning, There is some sense that we have to reach up and get godly wisdom and apply it is that the Holy Spirit is here meeting with us and we are a congregation of people being built up. So it is of all churches that name the name of Christ, they are a a temple, they are a dwelling place for God in a corporate sense gathering together. And so um, we're going to take care how we build into the temple, which is God's church. Now, the Bible uses a couple metaphors. When sometimes it says, walk in this way, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, it's simply saying, well, you don't go take a walk. It's it's an imagery for live your life. When Paul says here, be careful how you build, he's saying, be careful how you live. You live your life in such a way that you're contributing to the building up of God's church, his temple here. And that's what he's going to take up in verse 12. Now, verse 12 has a bit of warning, and we're going to come back to the, um, to the reward analogy. But in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, Now, if anyone builds on the foundation that he's just described with six kinds of building material, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. We need to talk about this verse for a moment. If you're circling, you circle anyone, each one, each one. What Paul is driving at is the individual responsibility of every follower of Christ to participate in the building up of the church that he is building. He's the foundation of. And it is particular, and that means that while the pastor is preaching a sermon this morning, every individual in the room must see yourself in this verse, that you are building up the body of Christ. And a day is coming when there will be some kind of assessment for what you're doing to build up the church that is so important to God. Now, there's six kinds of building material. This is imagery in Paul's mind. What would you build a great building with? Well, some of you have probably built a fort when you were small, and you used sticks and straw for the roof, and that's okay you could get away for a couple hours in it. Um, But if you're going to build an edifice that is going to endure, the the two kinds of material in descending order, gold, silver, precious stones, is superior material, precious material that is meant to endure. And on the other hand, the other materials are not. Um, It is wood, hay, and straw. And they're not going to survive the evaluation of the test of fire that's coming. 
I want to suggest to you that when Paul is using those kinds of materials, he's using an illustration or imagery. Those six materials are not necessarily your gifting or your position or your material wealth. It's simply talking about what you do with what you have will either be shown to be like gold, silver, precious stones, or it will be seen to be like wood, hay, and straw. It won't matter. And so as we live our life, working out our life, um, building up God's purposes in the world, at some day that's going to be evaluated by a fire that will test every person's work, and some will last and some will not last. Verse 14 goes on. If the work that one has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Again, the result of some future evaluation by the Lord Jesus Christ of all of us for the way we have walked, built, or lived our life toward God's purposes of building up his church are going to be evaluated, and some are going to survive the evaluation, and some are not going to survive. It's an indication, I think, of what God knows about what we do for him, not what others see about us, as we're going to see in a moment. It's not about the result, because who gives the increase? Yeah, God does. So it's not about even the fruitfulness of it, the size of the ministry, the size of what you do. It's about something else that only God can see about why you do what you do the way you do it that someday when we stand before God is going to be evaluated and some's going to go, and some's going to be met with, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And there will be some reward that will be perceivable to all of us when we stand before the Lord. Now, some of you look scared. Don't be. This is like a a, a barometer. It's like a a true north. It's like, oh yeah, someday I'm going to stand before God. Do you think most of the people in the world are living their life today thinking that one day at any moment they could stand before the Lord? I have a feeling that many people live their whole life without any conception that one day I'm going to have to give an account of my life before God. And what Paul is saying is that there will be some sense that for the one who is a Christian, even he and she are going to stand before the Lord and there will be some sense that there will be a loss of reward that may occur. He himself will be saved but only as through fire. Let's see if we can help unpack this a little bit. I told you that I think Jesus actually wired us to be reward mindful. Keep your finger here and turn left in your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus' first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus actually begins with uh, an admonition to those who are listening to him in Matthew chapter 6, and he says, be careful the way you live. Be careful, in fact, of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites in the synagogues and the streets do, that they may be praised by others. I tell you, they've already received their reward in full. Can you imagine bringing an offering to church and having somebody ahead of you blow a trumpet? Here comes the, the gift. But that's actually what they did. Why? Because they wanted other people to notice how righteous they were. But Jesus says to them, when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing so that your giving may be in secret. And then your Father who sees in secret will reward you. What's Jesus saying? What you do, how you build, how you live is in your heart as unto the Lord. It's not even the size of the gift you give. 
It's the heart with which you give it, and only Jesus can see that. People might see that it's a big gift, oh, but it might not be a big gift if, if it's only a little splinter of your wealth. But God knows what the heart of the gift is. In verse 6, um, he, he says, when you pray, shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. Again, in verse 17 and 18, when you fast, if you fast, don't make yourself look terrible like, oh, I haven't eaten in four hours. You know, when you fast, when you do your fast, you know, don't try to look terrible so people say, oh, you really are a righteous person. No. When you fast, don't let it be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and the Father who sees in secret will, everybody, reward you. So this is the first sermon Jesus ever gave, and he's trying to get you to think, your life is for God. How are you living your life? How are you building your life? And this is what's in Paul's mind when he comes. Paul spoke about having to give an account at the end of our life in a couple other places. After Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 6, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, Paul wrote, "Um, so whether we are at home in our body, we're here on earth, or we're away from here, we make it our aim to please the Lord in everything we do. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Ooh, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? So that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. That's Paul writing to a group of Christians. We're all going to stand before God and give an account for what we have done in our body, how we have lived, how we have built, how we have walked, what our life is like. We're going to give an account before him at a judgment seat of Christ. Judgment seat there, and then the next verse I'm going to show you is the word bima. It's a tribunal. It's as if we're going to stand before a judge who knows everything about us, and we're going to give an account for our lives. You say, well, wow, I know somebody who's really in trouble. No, 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 that's not the point of this. In fact, the next verse in Romans chapter 14, Paul says this, "Um, so why do you pass judgment on somebody else, on your brother? Why do you despise your brother? We will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue will confess to God, so then each one of us will give an account to himself. You only give an account for you. The only one you're responsible for and how you're living your life is between you and God. And someday in the future when you stand before God, there will be an accounting that we will give to God for what we have done with what God has given to us. Let me be emphatic. Whatever this evaluation is, For every person who is a follower of Christ, what is not in question at that judgment is our sin. And everybody said, why is your sin not in question? Because Jesus paid for your sins as the full, final atoning sacrifice for sins that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Answer. In the first service they said no one. Okay, no one can bring a charge against God's people because he has saved them by his grace. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Whatever this evaluation is, it's for what we have done with what we have had in our life. And it's God's a judgment of us in what he can see. So I take it this way. Anyone who does a work for God, teach kids, help disciple people, give your money, pray, fast, whatever you do to help build up the temple which is his church, it's not the result that comes from what you give that will be rewarded. 
because that's on God. It will be the internal qualities of the heart, of, of motive, of purity, of faithfulness, of something that God can see that no one else can see. And what Paul is saying, we're, we're all going to give an account for what we have done, whether it is good or bad. The very last words that Jesus said in the Bible recorded for us in Revelation chapter 22 said, Behold, I'm coming quickly and I'm bringing my recompense with me to repay each for what he has done. I'm the Alpha Omega, the first, the last, the beginning and the end. I'm coming. Um, What is that designed to do? Terrify us? No. It's just like to get us in God thinking. There is a God, we will give an account, he is coming again. Take care how you build your life. Be careful what you do. And I think what Paul is saying to the Corinthian church is build your life to be rewarded from your Father in heaven. You know, live for God. And do what you do for his glory first. Now in the next verse in our text, verse 16, Paul talks about the collective gathering of the church. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. There is a sense that when we gather together, God is with us. He meets with us and and it really draws us to want to say, I want to be right with God. I, I want him to dwell here. There's a warning if you destroy the work that God is doing in his church, he will take care of you. It's a warning. Now the next verses that Paul talks about are the wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God. We've talked about that a great bit, but let me conclude our time together this morning, starting in verse 21. In verse 21, um, again, remember this, the, the way the argument comes down, stop boasting in your leaders or your association with certain important people. Let no one boast in men. Don't put your, your boast in any human being. Why? You might say, well, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. No, you have both Paul and Apollos. All things are yours. Everything's yours. Paul, Apollos, Cephas, the world, life, death, Everything that's here now, everything that's coming in the future, it's all yours. It's as if Paul is saying, stop splintering yourself, saying, this is my camp. No, you belong to God, so all of the teachers that he gives to you are yours. All the world is yours. This present world, the world to come, The earth is the Lord and all it contains and it's yours. So when you go out and you look at the beauty of nature, you should say, God, thank you for what you created. I'm going to inherit the earth. Death is yours. What does that mean? Who wants death? It's put in this context to say, death is yours. That when you experience death, Even death itself is the window through which you enter into eternal life and you sort of shed this life and all of its frailty and weakness and sin and tears and sickness and you enter into eternal life and so shall we always be with the Lord. You have death and it's not an enemy. And the present, the future, it's all yours. And you belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to God. So if you're in Christ, you're with God, you have all that God intends you to, stop boasting in men, make your boast in God. You see the argument? Does it just make you so excited? I mean, it's real. But you know what? I I just have a feeling we're probably too trained to think in human wisdom. What Paul is saying is, no, no, you belong to Christ. You have everything. Stop splintering. Paul finished it up this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And if we're the children of God, then we're heirs with God and heirs with Christ. You know, we, 
we're, we're with Christ. And if you're with Christ, then you're joint heirs of everything that will come to Christ. You're going to experience that. Chapter 8, verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Answer, no one that matters, no one. He who did not spare his own son, which we're about to enjoy remembering, will he not with him freely also give us all things? Answer, yes, he will. And so as we commune in this morning and drink this cup, let's give praise to God. And let us think to ourselves, in what way am I building my life for God's glory and my eternal reward? Rewards which, by the way, we will um, mirror to His glory. Let's pray together. Thanks for joining us for our series in 1 Corinthians, Undivided. If you found this video helpful, click the like button and subscribe to our channel. It helps more people discover resources like this from Calvary Bible Church. Learn more about us at calvarybible.com and join us again next week as we discover our identity, purpose, and unity in Jesus Christ.